The uh, next piece is um, The Funniest Man You Ever Saw. This was printed in The New Yorker in August 15, 1931, and then later in The Middle-Aged Man on the Flying Trapeze in 1935. Everybody seemed surprised that I had never met Jack Coleman. Judas, I didn't know there was anybody who didn't know Jack Coleman. He's funnier than hell. He certainly is funny. He's marvelous. Do you know him, Joe? I know him. <clears throat> Judas, I'll never forget that one night at Jack Rudolph's. Coleman was marvelous that night. There was, that was a couple of years ago when Ed Wynn was here for a new show. Let's see, what the devil was it? Uh, not the crazy fool. The perfect fool. Yes, but that wasn't, it wasn't that one. It, what the Dickens was it? Well, never mind. Anyway, there was a scene in it. Was where... it simple, Simon? No, it was a couple years before that. Oh, I know. Uh, wait, I know it now. It was the Manhatters. Edwin wasn't in that. Wynn wasn't in that show. Well, it doesn't make any difference. Anyway, in this scene, he has a line where... Um, Manhattan Mary. That, that, that's it. That's it. That's it. Well, in this scene, he comes on with a rope, but kind of a larry. Halter. It was a halter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyway, he comes on with this halter. Who comes on? Coleman? No, no. Wynn comes on with a halter, and he walks up to the footlights, and some guy asks him what he's got the rope for, what he's doing with the halter. Well, says Wynn, I either lost a horse or found a piece of rope. I think he said, I've either found a piece of rope or lost a horse. Losing the horse coming last is funnier. Oh, well, anyway, Jack Coleman used to elaborate on the idea, and this night at Jack Rudolph's, I thought we'd all pass away. I nearly did. What did this Coleman do? Well, he'd go out in the kitchen, see, and he'd come in with a Unita biscuit, and he'd say, look, I either lost a biscuit box or found a cracker. I That's guess the right order, isn't it, Chris? I guess you're right. I guess you're right. It uh, sounds right. It, it, he, he says, then he'd do the same thing with everything he picked up. No matter what, finally he went out of the room, and he was gone a half an hour or so, and he comes down the stairs and holds up this faucet, and he says, I've either lost a bathtub or found a faucet. He then screwed the faucet from the bathtub, and he comes downstairs with his faucet. See? See what I mean? Laugh, I thought I'd pass away. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't anything. What will he hear? Along about two in the morning, he slips out again, see? All the way out of the house this time, well, I'll be doggone if that guy, that, that guy didn't come back carrying an honest-to-God chancel rail. He did. I'm telling you, son of a gun had actually gotten into a church somehow, and he wrenched part of this chancel rail loose, and there he was standing at the door, and he says, I've either lost a church or found the chancel rail. It was rich. It was the richest thing I ever saw. Helen Rudolph had gone to bed, I remember. She wasn't very well. But we got her up, and he did it again. He was rich. <laughs> Sounds like a swell guy to have around. He'd darn near pass away. <laughs> he really would. But he's got this new gag now. He's got a new gag. This is funny as the Dickens. He keeps taking things out of his pockets or off a table or something and says that he's just invented them. He always takes something that's been invented for years, say like a lead pencil or something, and goes into this long story about how he thought it up one night. I remember he did it with about 20 different things one night at Jack's. Jack Rudolph's? Yes. He likes to drop in on them, so you can usually find him there. So we usually drop in on them, too. Uh, well, this night, he took out a package of those lifesavers and handed us each one. And, and I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> and gave us each one of these mints and asked us what we thought of them. <laughs> asked us whether we thought they'd go or not. It's a little thing I thought up one day, he said. Then he'd go on with a long rigmarole about how he happened to think of the idea. And then he'd take the pencil out of his pocket and you'd ask what he thought of the eraser at the end of it. <laughs> Just a little gadget I thought up the other night, he said. <laughs> then he said, I'll show you what it's for. So he makes everybody take out a piece of paper and he says, now everybody makes some pencil marks on the paper, any kind. I won't look. So then he goes into another room and, he's like, and he says to let him know when you're ready. So we all make some marks on the piece of paper and somebody goes and gets him out of the other room. They always go and get him out of the other room. Sure, sure. He comes out with his sleeves rolled up like a magician. 
but the funniest thing he does. Well, and he gathers up the papers and he erases the marks of, with the eraser and he says, oh, it's just a novelty. I'm not going to try to market it. <laughs> Laugh, I thought I'd pass away. Of course, you really ought to see him do it. You know, the way he does it's a big part of it. Solemn, solemn and all. He's always solemn, always acts solemn about it. The funniest thing he does is fake card oh, tricks. Oh, yes, 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 yes. He does these fake card, <laughs> fake card tricks. You take a pack of cards. <laughs> you take a pack of cards. You take a pack of cards, and he'll ask you to take any card, and you take one, and he says, put it anywhere in the deck. And then you do it, and he makes a lot of passes and so on, and you know, and then, like a magician. Yeah, and then he draws out the wrong card, or maybe he looks at your card first. Then he goes through the whole deck, and he finds it and shows it to you. Sometimes he just lays the pack down and acts as if he never started any trick. Does he do imitations? Does he do imitations? Wait till I tell you. <laughs> Next is the Topaz Cufflinks Mystery. It was uh, published in the New Yorker, July 23rd, 1932, and later in the Middle-Aged Man on the Flying Trapeze, 1935. When I came roaring up on my motorcycle, unexpectedly out of Never Never Land, the way motorcycle cops do, the man was on his hands and knees in long grass beside the road, barking like a dog. The woman was driving slowly along in a car that stopped about 80 feet away. Its headlights shone on the man. What's going on here? <laughs> Cockeyed. <laughs> I guess it's, it's gone. I uh, couldn't find it. Well, what was it? What I lost? Some, some cufflinks, topazes set in gold. They were the color of a fine Moselle. Hunt things better with your glasses off? I'm nearsighted. I can't hunt things at distance with my glasses on, but I do better with them off if I'm close to something. He was barking so that I could see where he was. <laughs> what I don't get is how you lose your cufflinks 100 feet in front of where your car is. A person usually stops his car past the place where he loses something, not 100 feet before he gets to the place. <laughs> You've been to a party? We're not drunk if that's what you mean. You people didn't lose no topazes. Is it against the law for a man to be down on all fours beside a road barking in a perfectly civil manner? No, ma'am. <laughs> I'll tell you how it was, officer. We were settling a bet, okay? Okay. Well, who went? The lady bet that my eyes would shine like a cat's do at night if she came upon me suddenly, close to the ground alongside the road. We had passed a cat whose eyes gleamed. We had passed several persons whose eyes did not gleam. Simply because they were above the light and not under it. A man's eyes would gleam like a cat's if people were ordinarily caught by headlights at the same angle as a cat's eye. A cat's eyes are different than yours and mine. Dogs, cats, skunks, it's all the same. They can see in a dark room. Not a totally dark room. Yes, they can. No, they can't. Not if there is no light at all in the room. Not if it's absolutely black. The question came up the other night. There was a professor there, and he said there must be at least a ray of light no matter how faint. Well, that may be, but people's eyes don't shine. I go along these roads every night, and I pass hundreds of cats and hundreds of people. The people are never close to the ground. I was close to the ground. Look at it this way. I've seen wildcats in trees at night, and their eyes shine. There you are. That proves it. I don't see how. Because a wildcat and a tree's eyes are higher than the level of a man's. Took your glasses off so the headlights wouldn't make your glasses shine, huh? That's right. Smart guy. I still don't see where the wildcat proves anything. Look, you claim that the whole thing depends on how low a cat's eyes are. I, I didn't say that. I said it depends on how high a man's eyes are. Thank <laughs> you.